Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Thank you so much for choosing to spend a little time with us viewing our Sunday morning worship experience. And I pray that you will receive something that will help you on your journey. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us to place our hearts under the control of the Holy Spirit so that wealth won't control us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our subject for today is faith will balance wealth. Faith will balance wealth. Uh, and uh, our text is found in Matthew's chapter 6, verse 28 through 34. That's Matthew's chapter 6, verse 28 through 34. I'm reading the English Standard Version. Verse 28 says, And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall I eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, or worry about tomorrow in essence. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself, and sufficient for the day is its own troubles. Again, our subject is faith will balance wealth. And uh, our attempt is to gain an insight into a workable idea of balancing spirituality with wealth. We are accustomed to dividing life into the spiritual and the material, even though Jesus never made such division. In many of his parables, Jesus made it clear that uh, a right attitude towards wealth is a mark of spirituality and, or, and true spirituality at that. The parable of the rich fool in Luke, I think, chapter 12, uh, verse uh, 13 through 15, and I'm just going to read a, uh, three verses of it. Uh, it reads, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell, your, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the things, in the abundance of his possessions. And Pharisees were covetous, uh, as stated in Luke chapter 16, verse 14, and used religion to make money. And I believe that's even uh, true in this day and time, that there's a tendency to preach and teach by some of us to gain wealth instead of gaining lost souls for the kingdom of God. I found that we can have it both ways if we would only apply Matthew 6 and 33. If we have the true righteousness of Christ in our lives, then we will have a right attitude towards material wealth. Nowhere did Jesus magnify poverty or criticize the reasonable getting of wealth. God made all things, including food, clothing, and per precious metals. And God has declared that all things that he made are good, as stated in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. God knows that we need certain things in our lives to, in order to live. Uh, for the Gentiles, uh, he says, uh, seeks after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. In fact, he has given us richly all things to enjoy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says, As for the riches of this present age, charge them that 
charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. It's not wrong to possess things or have uh, wealth, but it is wrong for things to possess us. The sin of idolatry is as dangerous as the sin of hypocrisy. There are many warnings in the Bible against covetedness. Uh, one of the first one is Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, part of the Ten Commandments where God said, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor thy neighbor's ass, his ox, or anything that is, belongs to your neighbor. And then Psalms 119, verse 36 says, Give me a bent for your word of wisdom and not for piling up loot. That's the message version. In other words, uh, train me to favor the wisdom that com comes from your word uh, as a form of security instead of uh, piling up loot or stuff. He pointed out that the sad consequence of covetedness and idolatry uh, leads to several things that are hurtful to us. First of all, it enslaves us. Materialism will enslave the heart. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. According to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, the mind is enslaved also. And, and uh, verse 22 uh, through 23. And then the will uh, is uh, enslaved. And we find that in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 24. We can become shackled by the material things of life, but we ought to be liberated and controlled by the Spirit of God. It, get, it grieves the Holy Spirit when we are controlled by the material things of life. And if the heart loves material things and put the earthly gains above heavenly investments, then the result can only be a tragic loss. The, the right place for earthly treasures is to put them to use for God's glory. But if we gather material things for ourselves, we will lose them and we will lose our hearts with them. But instead of spiritual enrichment, we will experience hardship. So what does it mean to lay up treasures in heaven? It means to use all that we have for the glory of God. It means to hang loose when it comes to the material things of life. Don't, 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 uh, Pour your all into all of your day and all of your energy and all of your effort, all of your thought into uh, thinking of material things of life. Just hang loose and, 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 and work at being God's glory and God will richly supply all of our needs. It also means the measuring, uh, the measuring life uh, by the true riches of the kingdom and not by the false riches of this world. It not only enslaves the heart, but it also enslaves the mind. Matthew 6, chapter verse 22 and 23 says, uh, God's, word is, uh, God's word often uses the eye to represent the attitude of the mind. And if the eye is properly focused on the light, then the body can function properly in its movement. But if the eye is out of focus and seems seeing doubles, its uh, result is unsteady movement. In, in other words, you can't look in two directions at the same time. And you sure can't, if you can't look in two directions, you can't go in two directions. And, 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 and wealth, will pull us in a different direction from God. It's very difficult to make progress while we're trying to look in two di different directions at the same time. And if our aim in life is to get material gain, it will mean darkness within us. 
But if our outlook is to serve and glorify God, there will be light within us. And it's good when you can walk in the light and be sure of where you're going. If what should be light is really darkness in us, then we are being controlled by darkness and our outlook will determine our outcome. Finally, materialism can enslave the will, as stated in Matthew 6 and 24. We cannot serve two masters simultaneously. Either Jesus Christ is our Lord or money or mammon is our Lord. It's a matter of the will. Rich, uh, uh, but those who want to get rich fall into the temptations and snares, according to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6 and verse 9. If God grants us richly and you, we use them for his glory, then riches are a blessing. But if we desire to get rich and to live with the, that outlook, we will pay a great price for those riches that we might obtain. And then uh, covetedness and going after desiring riches, uh, overly desiring riches to use for our glory can bring about devaluation. Covetedness will not only cheapen our riches, but it will also cheapen us. We will start to become worried and anxious, and, and this anxiety is unnatural and it's unspiritual. The person who pursues money thinks that riches will solve all of their problems, when in reality, riches will create more problems in our lives. Remember the, the man who uh, with the bumper crop, uh, he, he, he had a great uh, harvest that year, and so much so that he decided to tear down his small barns and build bigger barns so that he would have ample space to store his bumper crop. And, and he made a mistake to, to, to and, 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 and we must be careful that we don't make that same mistake. He started... Uh, uh, laying claim to what wasn't his. Uh, Psalms 24 and 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein belong to him also. And so that night when he decided that his soul belonged to him, he said to himself, Soul, take thine ease, for you have much possessions laid up for you. Take it easy and, and enjoy life for a while, in essence, what he was saying. But that very night, God came to him and reclaimed what was really his. He just allowed him to be a steward of it. And whatever we are in possession of, God has allowed us to be stewards of it or managers of it, not owners of it. And his soul didn't even belong to him. Because God said, this day is your soul required of you. And then remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, uh, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what does the law say? Uh, and and, and uh, he ended up uh, saying that, well, the law, I have kept that from my youth up. What yet do I, uh, am I short of? And Jesus said, sell what you have and give to the poor and then come follow me and you will have eternal life. A and he went away sorrowful because he could not stand to part with his wealth. And a lot of times we lose out on the joy of life, the true joy, the true riches of life, because we can't, uh, we can't allow anything to come between us and our possessions. Material wealth gives a dangerous false sense of security that leads to feeling 
uh, the feeling ends in tragedy. The birds and the lilies do not fret or worry, but yet they have God's wealth in ways that we cannot duplicate. All of the nature uh, depends on God, and God never fails nature. Only mortal man depends on money, and money always fails. Jesus said that worry is a sin, and instead of Helping us live longer, anxiety only makes life shorter, as stated in Matthew 6 and 27. The Greek word translated uh, take no thought literally means to be drawn in different directions. Worry pulls us apart in different directions. And, and I stated earlier about the difficult in trying to look in two different directions simultaneously and trying to walk in two different directions until man uh, interfered. Everything in nature works together because all of nature trusts God. Man, on the other hand, is pulled apart because he tries to live his own life by depending on material wealth. It's not hard to see that riches or wealth or money is not sinful, but it is the love and the control that we give it over ourselves, over our lives, that is a sin. God feeds the birds and the, he clothes the lilies and he, he will feed and clothe us. It is our little faith that hinders him from working as he desires in our lives to provide for us, to be our Jehovah Jireh. He has great blessings for us if only we would yield to him and live for the riches that last forever. Uh, covetousness will cause us to lose our testimony. To worry about material things is to live like the heathens, as stated in uh, verse uh, 31 and through 33 in the sixth chapter of Matthew. Again, to worry about material things is to live like heathens, like we don't even know God. If we put God's will and God's righteousness first in our lives, he will take care of everything else. What a testimony it is to the world when a Christian dares to practice Matthew 6 and 33, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and allow him to add all of the stuff that the heathens uh, seek after. What a tragedy it is when so many of us fail to practice Matthew 6 and 33. And then covetedness, causes a loss of joy today. Being controlled by wealth causes us to lose joy today. Worrying about tomorrow does not help either tomorrow or today. If anything, it robs us of our effectiveness today, which means that we will even be less effective tomorrow. Someone has said that the average person is crucifying himself between two thieves, the regret of yesterday and the worry about tomorrow. It is right to plan for the future and even save for the future. It, it's, it's a good thing to prepare for your retirement but don't think that you can prepare a good retirement all by yourself. You need God's help. And God can make what's so hard and impossible for us easy for us. And I'm not talking about what I heard somebody say. I'm talking about what I have learned personally with my relationship with the Lord. It's a good feeling to get paid not to go to work after working so many years to get paid. Uh, 
It's a sin to worry about the future and allow tomorrow to rob today of its joy and blessings. Three words in the section that we've uh, been studying from today uh, points to the way to victory over worry. The first one is found in Matthew 6, chapter verse 30, and it's faith. Trusting God to meet our needs. That's faith. And it, it gives us victory over worry. The second one is found in Matthew 6 and 32. It's Father. Knowing that our Heavenly Father cares for his children. And then the last one, the third one is first. Matthew 6 and 33. Putting God's will first in our lives so that he might be glorified. If we have faith in our father and put him first, he will meet our every need. Philippians 4 19 says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to your, to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Hypocrisy and anxiety are sins. And if we practice the true righteousness of the kingdom, we will avoid these sins and live for God's glory. We have the victory that provides the greatest riches. We have a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. And there is no greater riches than, that, than to have a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. No greater riches. Because Jesus died one Friday on an old rugged cross and he was buried in a borrowed tomb, but right early the third day morning, he rose with all power in his hand. So instead of focusing on riches, let's uh, focus on a relationship with our Heavenly Father and where it began when Jesus died to, 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 to open the way for us to go to God in prayer and, and, and to have a relationship with him. When Jesus died, when he hung his head in the locks of his shoulder and died for our sins in our place, the veil in the temple that was symbolic of a wall that separated mankind from God, when Jesus died, that veil tore from top to bottom. Notice what's happening there. There's an indication that it did not tear from bottom to top. Therefore, it was not based upon what we did, but it tore from top to bottom. It was what God did for us. And therefore, we are saved by grace. We are allowed to have a relationship with God, our Heavenly Father, by grace, through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. Uh, now, not only did he die and was buried, but God raised him up from the grave and gave him all power in heaven and in earth. Power to lift up bowed down heads. Power to reveal the truth to us through his word. Power to uh, uh, establish right thinking and right attitudes in our lives, right focuses, power to live right and in a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. So don't forfeit, forfeit. Don't give away what is most valuable for that which is least valuable. Allow the Holy Spirit to refocus your mind, to change your attitude about what is valuable are most valuable. Well, that's all I've got for today. So let's uh, close with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, your living word, and we anticipate that you will cause it to come alive in us so that we can live for your glory and not for wealth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For many, many months, at this point, you've heard me say in Bible study and in sermons, 
that it's important that we wear the mask and that we uh, practice social distancing or physical distancing from one another uh, when we're in public and whatever, and uh, that we wash our hands often. Those are three important things for the season that we're in, this COVID-19 season. And uh, I think we've gotten to the point where we have become too lax. We don't take it seriously. When yesterday there was 184,000 new cases, 184,000 plus new cases in one day. There have been, uh, as of yesterday, there was a million new cases from Monday to yesterday. That's a lot of new cases of the, the virus. And this is a virus that does not play, play. It does not have any respect of person. So let's get back to being serious and being serious about saving others' life and saving our own life. So the three things that we can do, we don't have a, a, a vaccine yet, but there are three things that we can do now that will change the increase in cases to decrease in the cases to where we can make it until a vaccine come along and we won't be desperate for a vaccine. So wear your mask, practice social distancing, wash your hand often, and be aware of what large holiday gatherings can do for a family. It's these holiday gatherings that's wrecking havoc in families. So let's be careful. Uh, that's it for my soapbox. Take care, and we'll see you farther on up the road. Bye-bye.